Hello and welcome to the That Dinosaur Guy channel and my first video presentation. This is intended as something of a podcast. There will be pictures in the background, but feel free to sit back, relax, and do something else while you listen. Treat this as a podcast, if you will. Otherwise, welcome again. Uh, my name is Josh, and I am, in this first episode, just going to take you through something of an overview of my knowledge of dinosaurs, paleontology, and uh, just a fun romp through through the, sort of the general landscape of things. Future podcast uh, presentations will be more specific on their topic matter, but I just wanted this introduction one to be a nice general overview. So yeah, sit back, relax, and let's get underway. It will consist of sort of four general sections. Um, first one is we'll go through some general definitions and, and general knowledge. The second section we'll look through some names of dinosaurs and sort of test test our knowledge, as you will, on what dinosaur this could be. There'll be English translations, and you will have to guess the, uh, the dinosaur's name. Third section is we'll look at some quote-unquote myths and, and other newer information that has come about. And then lastly, we'll have a section on, on some more in-depth information with some more specific niche questions um, that as you explore paleontology as an adult, you start to learn. Um, I've always found, I've been interested in dinosaurs since I was very small, uh, since I was a child, but I've always found that as you get more into it as an adult, there's a wealth of very interesting niche knowledge that um, doesn't necessarily come up in children's media. So we'll explore that in the in the final section. So stick with me. It's going to be a nice long one. And uh, I hope you enjoy. If you have any questions, please put them in the comments. Um, I do also, before we begin, I do have a Patreon that I have recently set up. Um, all my content will always be free. I will always upload the content for free on YouTube. But if you feel like you want to support me per upload, um, please check out my Patreon. Um, it will only charge you per video upload, and I try to upload once a month. So, there. Um, also, while you're here, if you wouldn't mind subscribing and clicking on the little bell, it really helps out little YouTubers like me. So, I'll begin us off with some easy basics, really. Uh, what does the word dinosaur mean? Well, dinosaur itself roughly translates as um, terrible lizard or terrible reptile. Um, it was first coined by Sir Richard Owen back in about 1842. Um, he looked at this group of uh, the, the fossils that had been discovered and realised that they shared traits that should likely make them their own group and so with the common knowledge at the time being that these were there was a large lumbering reptiles he coined the term dinosaurus or dinosaur which translates as a roughly translates as terrible terrible lizard or terrible reptile next can you name the three periods of dinosaur history now Hopefully, you can name at least two. Generally, when I ask this question of people, we get we get two of the three. Um, so uh, obviously, the three are the Triassic period, the Jurassic period, and the Cretaceous. Usually, people get the Jurassic and Cretaceous, but the Triassic is often forgotten, unfortunately. So we'll, we'll take a look at all three as we're here. Now, the Triassic period uh, was obviously the first period um, in what's called the Mesozoic Era. And the Mesozoic Era encompasses all three of those previously named periods. So Triassic, Jurassic and Cretaceous. Um, and it occurred between about 251 million years and 199 million years ago. And that gap in there. 
and it followed on from a great mass extinction at the end of the previous period called the Permian period. Um, and one of the defining traits of the Triassic really is this huge continent. There was one huge landmass called Pangaea, surrounded on all sides by ocean, and such a large landmass gave huge seasonal variations to the um, along the coasts, primarily. And it wasn't just seasonal variations in terms of time of year, but you also had huge variations between the outer outlying coasts and the inner central deserts. Now this occurs because the oceans, water, is a great equaliser in terms of the uh, seasonal weather and the seasonal climate, sorry. And when half your planet is ocean and half your planet is roughly land, the areas in the centre have extremes of temperature and you tend to get deserts and other extremes and deserts can be very cold at night, very cold at certain points of year and extremely hot at others. So um, seasonal variation was a huge trend in the Triassic period. And although the Triassic itself was the beginning of what we would term the, the dinosaur life story, it only really saw dinosaurs as a group emerging towards the end. And in the early and, and, and mid Triassic especially, there were, it, it was ruled more by ancient reptiles, reptiles that had survived the extinction event of the Permian, and ruled this land. And you, you had um, creatures like Placerias and Domesticucus, which you know, walked on four legs and, and resembled large reptiles. Um, ironically similar to how dinosaurs were initially portrayed. Later on, um, dinosaurs did take over. Um, they adapted a, a body plan that was successful, a body plan that let them conserve energy in their movements. Um, and one of the main themes of this body plan was legs that sat beneath the body. Uh, and the first forms of, of dinosaurs really evolved to exploit that plan. Um, forms such as Coelophysis, um, Lesothosaurus. The, these, these dinosaurs evolved to walk upright with their legs beneath their body. And, and this movement meant that unlike um, other creatures of the time, um, such as giant salamanders like Coelosuchus, um, Hesperosaurus, even the, 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 the crocodilomorphs that existed at this time, Smilosuchus, um, they would primarily rest with their bodies on the ground. They would have their legs um, sprawl to the side or, or in a semi-erect posture, not directly beneath their, uh, their torso. And, and moving with your legs um, sprawled like that, it requires a lot of energy. Primarily because you're having to move the whole body. The whole body undulates from side to side as you walk and as you as you move your bulk around. And you're also having to hoist that body up off the ground to be able to walk. And that takes up a lot of energy. Now, um, one of the successful traits of dinosaurs, as I mentioned, was the legs underneath the body. And when you have legs like that, your upper body doesn't need to move side to side. Um, you can essentially rest as well just by standing. You don't need to necessarily lower the body to the ground and then pick it back up again to be able to move. And the efficiency that this allowed dinosaurs to move with is what is one of the things that really allowed them to thrive and exist in places where there would not necessarily be enough food to support a metabolism that has to move with sprawled legs. Now, as we get into the late Cretaceous, um, you start to get larger dinosaur forms like Herrerasaurus um, and huge, for the time, herbivores like Platyosaurus, who would eventually go on and evolve into, into the other um, 
other species through the Jurassic. Now, recent sort of developments mean that we aren't actually entirely sure where Herosaurus sits. Um, it's most likely a basal theropod, that is to say, a theropod from earlier, uh, an earlier theropod. Um, but that's not entirely sure. Um, in terms of Platysaurus as well, it used to be called a prosauropod, but that group, that naming of that group has sort of fallen out of favour, and, and we now call them um, uh, Platysaurids or Platysauroids, just because we use Platysaurus really as the holotype for that group. Now, in terms of this podcast, those names are interchangeable, so if I use prosauropod or, or Platysaurid, it kind of means the same thing. It's it's a sauropod um, that evolved in the late Triassic uh, into the early Jurassic before we got the the, the four legged, large, long necked, more derived sauropods that people are familiar with, such as Diplodocus and such. Now, at the end of the Triassic, um, we did have a large ex- extinction event again. Um, it was pretty much one of the largest that had ever happened. I think it wiped out somewhere in the region of 90% of most life on Earth, including the ancient reptile lines that had ruled the early Triassic and mid-Triassic. This left dinosaurs with their efficient body plants to explore a wide variety of niches. And as we'll see going on, um, dinosaurs really did explode onto their own and, and fill as many of those niches as as they could. Following on from the extinction event at the end of the late Triassic, we move into possibly one of the better well known of the two periods. Uh, the last two periods, sorry, the Jurassic. This was a time period that spanned roughly fifty six million years. Um. From the end of the Triassic period uh, up until the beginning of the Cretaceous, um, it's actually named after the Jura Mountains uh, in the European Alps, um, which is where we first found rocks, limestone rocks from, from from that period, or identified them from the Jurassic. So, um, from the beginning of this period, what really marked it out is the fact that that large landmass, that large central landmass that was iconic of the Triassic has begun through tectonic action to break up. And we're now left with primarily two large landmasses, a northern landmass and a more southern landmass. The northern landmass being called Laurasia and the southern one being Gondwana. Now, as before, when I mentioned that um, the the fact there was one single landmass caused vast extremes between the outer and inner, and between seasons in the Triassic, the introduction of a breakup and the introduction of of waterways to to the two smaller landmasses meant that the climate of these lamases was much more stable than in the Triassic. Um, there was still seasonal extremes between wet and dry and between more inner and outer areas, but in general, when compared to the Triassic, um, the coastlines and the inner sort of forests were much more stable, less arid, more lush rainforest. Um, this particular period in dinosaur history gave rise to many of of the what we'll call charismatic megafauna of of the dinosaur period that that most people are familiar with. So this time period gave rise to um, Stegosauria, uh, Allosauroidae, those two groups, which obviously we get Stegosaurus and, and Allosaurus. Um, And, of course, as I mentioned before, with Platysaurus in the Triassic, the Jurassic gave rise to possibly, arguably, one of the most awe-inspiring groups of dinosaurs, uh, the the true sauropods, uh, the sauropods. This 
group itself existed from the late Triassic through to the end of the Cretaceous in one form or another. Um, we moved from, from uh, platysaurids, prosauropods, uh, through sauropod lines, all the way through to the titanosaurs at the end of the Cretaceous. Um, and they included such forms as Diplodocus, uh, with its <clears throat> long body, long tail, long neck, um, up to Camarasaurus, a bit of a taller specimen, um, Giraffatitan, uh, and its similar cousin Brachiosaurus, as well as huge examples like Argentinosaurus. Also, with the breakup of the land masses and the introductions of, of more seaways, we saw the diversification of many marine animals and many marine reptiles um, in particular. So we had uh, the seas being dominated by animals like uh, Cryptoclidus, um, which is a type of, of plesiosaur. We had uh, dolphin-like ichthyosaurs, like ophthalmosaurus, um, even types of mosasaur, like Lyplorodum, and of course, um, the ubiquitous ammonites, which you will commonly find fossilised in areas of Dorset, Lyme Regis, and the like. The air was also filled with uh, pterosaurs, which were um, diversifying as well. Um, smaller examples like Dimorphodon, all the way up to um, larger ones as well. And these, this diversification, this, this filling of niches which existed from the early Jurassic through to the late Jurassic and on through to the Cretaceous, really cemented dinosaurs as this global, powerful group of animals that, that filled all areas of, of, of life, that filled all niches that were on offer, that really showed that these animals had the capability, had the adaptability to, to, to fit into so many different areas of the world. Now the next period, or the last period of dinosaur history is of course the Cretaceous period. And this was a period that lasted approximately 79 million years. Um, there was a minor closing extinction event at the end of the Jurassic period, um, and then obviously at the end of the Cretaceous, we saw the deaths of most most dinosaurs, with the uh, KT extinction event, which we will talk about a little bit later. Now the Cretaceous period saw those land masses, the, the northern and southern land masses, break up further through tectonic action, and you start to see the land masses enter their present day positions. This continued breakup further stabilised the climate, and generally the Cretaceous period was quite warm um well not necessarily not necessarily as tropical as, as the jurassic but we did have a uh, high sea levels with numerous inland seas and a relatively warm climate um you know the seas themselves were still full of ammonites and other marine reptiles while the dinosaurs continued to dominate on land um during this time i believe it's when we start to saw the evolution of uh, avian theropods, also known as birds, as well as new groups of mammals and the introduction of flowering plants. Angiosperms began to evolve, which ushered in a new relationship between many groups of animals, but especially insects and plants, a relationship that continues to flourish to this day, that we ourselves rely upon for food and many other agricultural needs. Now, despite the small extinction event at the end of the Jurassic, um, dinosaurs continued to, di to diversify, and we saw the rise of many, many different groups within the larger groups from before. So, within the theropods, 
We saw the rise of the of Tyrannosaur Tyrannosauroids. We saw the rise of um, uh, Raptor forms, uh, Mana Raptorans. We saw the rise of Cacodontosaurids, Spinosaurids, Ablosaurs. And part, one of the reasons why we see such a diversification is, again, linked back to the breakup of these landmasses. When you isolate groups of animals and landmasses away from other similar groups of animals, over long enough time periods, those two groups will become, provided they are um, exposed to different conditions, you will have them evolve into different groups that eventually become their own species. Um, the islands of the island of Madagascar in modern time, as well as the Galapagos Islands, host many examples of animals with the same ancestors who have diversified and become their own genus. Um, so this happened in herbivores as well. We had ankylosaurs and nodosaurs, uh, marginocephalians like Pachycephalosaurus, Chasmosaurus, that sort of thing. Your hadrosaurs and your ornithopods all diversified out as well. You had the examples from the largest crocodilomorphs, something non-dinosaur related, including the 39 feet long Sarcosuchus, uh, a dinosaur killing crocodilomorph if ever there was one. And if you ever get a chance, I might recommend that you visit the Natural Museum of Nat National Museum of Natural History in Paris, where I believe they still have a 12 metre long Sarcosuchus fossilized skeleton. Well worth a look, it's uh, it's huge. Obviously at the end of the Cretaceous period we had the um, extinction event, the KT extinction event, which would wipe out most forms of life over around, I believe, between 6 and 10 kilograms. So the large megafaunal examples of dinosaurs and uh, crocodile moss and other animals like that, pterosaurs, marine reptiles, would all go extinct at the end of this. But dinosaurs themselves would live on in uh, derived avian theropods, aves, birds. So we'll get on to our next question. What killed the dinosaurs? Now, there are sort of we know there was an asteroid impact let's let's get that out of the way we know that an asteroid struck our planet around 65 million years ago we have the crater we have the the evidence of iridium there's a layer of rock um above which there are no dinosaur fossils below which there are plenty of dinosaur fossils from the cretaceous and there is a layer of rock that is seeded with iridium um as well as um other elements from that are only found in asteroids. Iridium itself is an incredibly rare terrestrial element, but it's found more commonly in asteroids. And this layer of iridium combined with the crater gives us a good idea that 65 million years ago, our planet was struck by an asteroid. Now, the two sort of competing theories, per se, are this, that had the first one been the silver bullet, and had this asteroid not struck the Earth, it is theorised that the dinosaurs would have continued to evolve, continued to diversify, continued to fill niches, lions would have died out, lions would have arisen, but that this asteroid was the thing that killed them off. Or killed off most forms, I should say. The quote-unquote competing hypothesis is that the asteroid was the final nail in the coffin and that through a combination of other factors be it climate change from the continued breakup of the uh, tectonic plates through to volcanic action in places like the Deccan faults through um, competition and loss of young from from evolving mammals and that sort of thing that this the dinosaurs were on on their way out, so to speak, that they were beginning to decline and that they would have gone extinct at a more 
leisurely pace, but would have gone extinct regardless, and, and new lines would have risen to replace them. And that the asteroid really was was the final blow that that sealed the fate of of um, of most dinosaurs. Now, on a very personal note, through my own studies, obviously I'm just a, a hobby paleontologist, but through my own studies and my own thoughts on this, my gut feeling is the the silver bullet hypothesis. And one of the main reasons for that, really, is that when you look back through the hundreds of millions of years that dinosaurs have existed, and it is an incredibly long time that this group of animals has been around, you know, two things that put it into perspective for me is, one, that Tyrannosaurus itself, 65 million years ago, 66 million years ago, is closer in geological history to the invention of the iPhone than it is being clo uh, closer to the existence of Stegosaurus. And the second one along that line is that when the Cretaceous period rolled around, um, species like Stegosaurus were already fossilized in the ground. And so were there dinosaur paleontologists, they could have come along and dug, and dug him up as well. It really gives an expanse as to how long these animals existed for. And time and time again, through their existence, they've proven themselves to be highly adaptable species. They have lived through extinction events, they have lived through the breakup of, of plates, they have lived through so many events and have adapted and filled niches and lions have gone extinct but other lions have arisen and, and, and they've always survived. Um, and when you look at an asteroid impact, it's an event that really no animal can knowingly adapt for. And so it wasn't just dinosaurs that went extinct during this. Um, it was a significant chunk of Mesozoic life that died out in the KT extinction event. And so I think it's wrong really to say that dinosaurs were on the way out for any other reason. Um, and even if, even if the asteroid had not hit, and even if um, they'd seen a drop in diversity through other actions, tectonic action, volcanic action, changing climates, etc., I still think we would have seen them bounce back through a minor a minor extinction event and you would have seen more lines emerge. But it is worth bearing in mind that in terms of numbers of species, while it's possible that we were seeing a decline in diversity, we only ever have a, a very brief snapshot, a very small data set really, of the number of species that exist. And it could be that actually species numbers were stable. Um, we just we just don't know, but that's my personal take. Um, as evidence comes out, obviously, perhaps that will change. So we'll move on to a different uh, a different question now. What is the study of prehistoric life, and what are the remains that are studied called? Now, obviously, the study of of prehistoric life is paleontology. It's my hobby. It's my passion. Um. Perhaps one day it will be my job. Perhaps one day it will be your job. Perhaps it is your job. Who knows who's listening to this? And if you are a paleontologist and you're listening to this, that's off to you. Give a shout out in the comments. I'd love to hear from you. In terms of the um, remains that are studied, as many people will know, these are called fossils. And there are, in basic terms, five types of fossils that we can we can study and we can find. Um, we have, of course, amber. So this is preserved insects, preserved plants, preserved parts of animals, sometimes preserved birds that have been enveloped in tree sap that has since fossilized, hard, and preserved the animal within. Uh, famous, made famous, of course, in Jurassic Park, um, with scientists extracting blood from mosquitoes fossilized in amber. The second way is petrification. And so things like petrified wood or uh, per permineralization is also called. You also find cast and mold fossils where the impression of the animal has been filled in by other substrate. Um, we have pyritized fossils so the replacement has been under, undergone by metallic elements such as iron. And then lastly, you have um, compression fossils. Okay, so the next 
part of this and I will show pictures on screen for those watching but if you're not watching if you're using this as a podcast I'll just describe the animals to you is let's cover is this a dinosaur now when you get packs of dinosaurs or sort of very generalist dinosaur media be it children's media or not often there are many animals that are included in those that aren't actually dinosaurs so the first example of this it's got a very long neck um you know got a little bit of a a sort of a barrel shaped dumpy body might have a short tail four flippers and a small head at the end of that neck often with needle sharp teeth is this a dinosaur now no this is not a dinosaur this is what would commonly be called a plesiosaur um it is a marine reptile and so they um this particular example is a lasmosaurus but they split from dinosauria or what would, they split from what would become dinosauria um earlier back in 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 history so they're off, they're often confused for dinosaurs but one of the key takeaways really here is that they spend their life um majority of their life in in water so they are not dinosaurs now the second animal here it's smaller um it has what looks like a beak or a bill it has membranous wings um that come off the finger and it has three little fingers sort of halfway up the wing is this a dinosaur uh it's a pterosaur and so the answer for this is no this animal is not a dinosaur Um, the particular one I'm looking at is Tapajara, but, um, any kind of, kind of pterosaur is not a dinosaur. They spend the majority of their life on the wing. Again, just like, um, marine reptiles, they separated earlier on. And although closely related and often included in, um, the old pack of dinosaurs, they are not themselves dinosaurs. They're a separate but closely related group. Uh, next one, which is is quite a a common one to find in in generic paco dinosaurs, uh, looks like a komodo dragon with a sail on its back. Uh, I'm of course talking about Dimetrodon here, and again, this is also not a dinosaur. Um, now, it's this existed before dinosaurs had even evolved. It's a type of ancient reptile more closely related to mammals than it is to dinosaurs um because it is a synapsid um they have a synapse we have a synapse in very basic terms it, it's more closely related to us than than dinosaurs um it it was still a wildly successful animal um it was an apex predator um but it went extinct um before dinosaurs had ever appeared on the scene so not a dinosaur though an equally fascinating animal nonetheless now the last one uh the last animal walks on two legs has its legs under its body has two long arms with large claws on the end uh kind of looks like a big feathery sloth with a bit of a bird head on it um uh, if you can't guess from that description this is a therizinosaurus and despite looking particularly weird with regards to typical members of this group it is actually a theropod so it is a member of the same larger family that tyrannosaurus and meat it, all the meat-eating dinosaurs fell into um it is a dinosaur in fact it has the the animal the legs underneath the body which is characteristic it lived on land which is characteristic um this particular example of uh is an interesting one for theropods because it is a herbivorous theropod it is thought to eat plants using its large claws to gather plant material um probably were also a fearsome defensive tool nonetheless so what can we learn from these four examples dinosaurs had their legs beneath their bodies um dinosaurs lived primarily on land and would stand upright uh, and could not fly at least not yet when it gets into the idea of birds um becomes a bit more blurred 
but birds evolved from dinosaurs and so from from by extension birds are dinosaurs whereas groups like pterosaurs and you know mammals like bats are different lineages entirely so uh this next section is all about dinosaur names i will for those that are watching there will be um silhouettes on the background but that's not necessarily necessary necessarily necessary i will read the name out in terms of the english approximate english translation let's see what we know about the names shall we so this dinosaur's name means big armed lizard it is of course brachiosaurus or probably more accurately these days giraffe titan but we'll put that aside for a moment um, big armed lizard refers to the fact that this sauropod its front legs or its arms were longer than its back legs which is unusual for most herbivorous dinosaurs most dinosaurs in general um, but in these types of sauropods where their, their, their neck and the head would be lifted off the ground and held high on the shoulders, the front legs were longer than the back legs. Tyrant Lizard King, one that I think most people will get, is of course Tyrannosaurus Rex, Rex being the key king part of that name. Not much real to say on T-Rex, a large carnivorous theropod. Um, debates going on as to whether it had lips and feathers. Personally, I would think that as an as it grew, it probably started off more fluffy and feathery, and then as it grow grew larger, it would discard the metabolic feathers um, because it was large enough that it wouldn't necessarily need them anymore. Um, as for lips, I think there's a good probability that there were lips. There were holes along the jaws that would. Um, show that there, there was possibility for, for blood vessels there to support lips um, but actually that's something we'll talk about towards the end so I won't cover too much of that now. Terrible Claw. Now if we remember that the name dinosaur or dinos or dinos means terrible then we can translate this one as Deinonychus. Terrible Claw. Um, believed to be the inspiration for the Jurassic Park raptors, which were then named uh, Velociraptor because it um, Velociraptor was thought to be more something that the audience would find more appealing and easier to remember and say than Deinonychus, though the Velociraptor itself was the size of a turkey. So ironically, that child at the start of Jurassic Park talking about a six-foot turkey, was right from the turkey point of view. Three-horned face, favourite amongst many children and a widely used dinosaur in, in many children's media. It would take three to mean tri, tricycle, triceratops. There he is in all his glory. Three-horned face, what can I say, absolutely huge, famous dinosaur. Um, wonderful ceratopsian, very large sort of prime example of, of them. Interesting in the fact that its frill, although probably still mostly used for, for display, its frill was solid bone. There were no holes in its frill. Many um, ceratopsians have large gaps in their, in, in their frills, um, probably covered in membranous skin, um, blood vessels that would allow for a lot of colour, but ultimately not maybe not used in, in as much in defence. Triceratops, perhaps a slight deviation from that, with having a solid bone frill. Interesting one here, wounding tooth. Now, if the word tooth is don, as in earlier we talked about dimetrodon, which is two measures of tooth, we get the name trudon, which, and I can be corrected by this in the comments section, believe trudon still to be a wastebasket taxon. It, it, it's a taxon where we would place um, or it's a dubious taxon, I should say. Uh, it's one that we don't know if it really exists in that way. But regardless, the name Wounding Tooth comes from the fact that the teeth that were found and attributed to this small theropod had serrations on both sides rather than just the back. And so Wounding Tooth was the name adopted for this animal. Fused Lizard. Uh, and if you couldn't guess from the 
club on the silhouette here. Fused lizard is Ankylosaurus, uh, basically a walking biological tank uh, with a large club on its tail, a wide rimmed mouth. Now, um, there were two sort of groups of armored dinosaurs like this in, in the Cretaceous. You had the nodosaurs, without, generally without club tails, and the ankylosaurs generally with. But one of the other features that really marked them out was that nodosaurs tended to have thinner heads or more selective eaters. Um, thinner mouths could be more, uh, you know, pick and choose what it is they wanted to eat. Ankylosaurs had a wider mouth and so were uh, regarded as more sort of generalist grazers. Meat-eating bull. One of my favourite dinosaurs um, has a whole section in the talk about theropods. Uh, if we take bull, same as the star sign, Taurus, meat-eating, carnivore, we get Carnotaurus, uh, a wonderfully um, derived, some might say bizarrely evolved animal with long legs, um, tiny arms, um, short head, and those wonderful horns on top of his head. Absolute favourite of mine. Um, if I had the chance to see any dinosaur in real life, I think I'd probably choose this or maybe a Spinosaurus. Double crested lizard. Now, this one's famous in Jurassic Park, but for probably all the wrong reasons. Um, it is, of course, um, Dilophosaurus. Now, Dilophosaurus in Jurassic Park was small, had a neck frill, spat venom. The actual example wouldn't have fit in your car. Um, it probably could have got its head in it, so Nedry probably wasn't quite as safe. It probably would have still met a very similar end, but needless to say, the actual animal. Uh, when fully grown was much larger, it didn't have the neck frill, and as far as we're aware, had no glands or capability to spit venom. It did keep the notch at the front of its mouth, which is, a, I believe, a callback to earlier coelophyses, which also had the beginnings of that notch. It's where the, the maxillary bone on the upper jaw um, attaches to the premaxillary. Um, it's a reoccurring feature in several species, even unrelated ones. Um, and also pops up again in, in Spinosaurs. So whether or not this animal was adapted to hunt fish or other slippery prey, um, I mean, it's a possibility. Um, or it could just be an, an example of, of con convergent evolution or, or something like that. Needless to say, not the same animal as in Jurassic Park. Uh, Iguana tooth. Now, this one should be fairly simple. If we know the name, the word Don means tooth. And it is, it has an iguana's shaped teeth. Then logically, we should be dealing with iguanodon. Um, as, as I just mentioned, named after its teeth, which at the time were um, we were still think of dinosaurs as these large lizards, and so its teeth, um, being a herb herbivorous, matched that of an iguana. Um, and so iguanodon was was really a logical choice here. Obviously, we see it now as much less of a large lizard and more a um, an evolved uh, herbiv herbivorous dinosaur, upright stance, um, kind of like a large cow if the cow had a giant spike on its thumb, really. Uh, but a lovely, a lovely British dinosaur nonetheless. Now, last example here: heavy claw. Um, this is another British dinosaur. There's a wonderful, um, I believe it's a cast of the fossil in the Natural History Museum. But this is a Small Spinosaurid, it is uh, Baryonyx. Uh, barrow meaning heavy. Um, onyx meaning claw or nail. Um, it's kind of a, a, rough, uh, a rough translation. Um, what it refers to is, is the large claw on the front legs, or arms, sorry, that would, it would use to hook, help hook fish. I think primarily a fish eater probably would have taken whatever it could have gotten uh, were it on land. Um, not quite as, as derived, perhaps, as, as later Spinosaurs, uh, but that claw would have been useful in, in, in hooking fish from the water, that its, its pointed teeth and the notch in its jaw could help catch. Okay, so next we shall just look at some more general sort of questions, myths, that sort of thing, um, before we move on to the really heavy stuff where people can fall asleep. So the first question is, Dinosaurs, birds, true or false? Did dinosaurs evolve into birds? What's what's going on? So really, 
Um, the answer to this is, is true, but it's more complex than that. So you'll really you'll never look at birds the same way again once I've done this once once this is over. Birds can really be more accurately described, in my estimations, as avian dinosaurs or avian theropods specifically. They're highly derived, um, that's to say specialized, relatively recent members of reptiles. So when you when you were a kid growing up, you tend to learn, oh, we've got so many groups of animals like mammals, birds, reptiles, insects, amphibians, fish, etc. When really it's more nuanced in that birds are a, a smaller section of reptiles themselves, which is pretty cool, really. Um, so we know about this, about bird dinosaurs evolving into birds, because feathers themselves um, are they're modified scales, essentially. Um, and they actually have a really interesting evolutionary history themselves, and I could can and will do an entire presentation about about just about feathers. Um, but I'll talk about them briefly now. And first off, there are many different forms and types of feather, um, some being more derived than others, but all birds tend to possess most of them uh, through from simple filaments through to flight feathers, um, panaceous feathers, all that sort of thing. Um, you can see a degree of feather evolution actually by studying baby birds. So if you ever get the chance or even just Google it, how birds develop in the egg mirrors much of how feathers themselves evolve from simple barbs down to fluffy down to the asymmetrical flight feathers. You can see them evolving and grow as, as, as they're in the egg and as they hatch and, and, and sort of grow into, into adult birds. Um, and yet you can see this pattern also mirrored through through theropods um, as they become more derived with regards to feather type and you see the same thing going on barbs th through to down through to um, flight feathers and, and display feathers. Um, we think that feathers probably arrived more for metabolic needs, uh, keeping the animal warm, reducing energy requirements, that sort of thing. And then Evolution, as evolution has no end goal, it wasn't we shall build these structures and then use them to fly, but they, um, through natural selection, uh, those that could use their feathers to, to, to for other needs, be it display, be it um, wing assisted vertical incline running, they uh, bred, made more babies that, that went on and developed that way. And so eventually, you know, you had you you develop gliding and you develop flight, and we have birds today that could fly. So it's it's a long, complex history um, over many hundreds of millions of years. So yeah, interesting stuff. True or false? Interesting one. Uh, and if you've watched Walking with Dinosaurs, you might have an opinion on this. Dinosaurs ate grass, or more specifically, was there grass in the Mesozoic? Uh, now it's it's sort of it's sort of a trick question. Um, the grass that we know, i.e., the grass that you have on your lawn, did not evolve until after dinosaurs or non-avian dinosaurs have become extinct. However, there are certain types of grasses related to rice. We have found them in dinosaur dung fossils, um, coprolites. We have found uh, fossil pollen from them, so we know that there was type of grass around in the Mesozoic. Um, sort of around the late, late Jurassic Cretaceous period, but we didn't. Not the grass that we knew of, that we know of, really. Um, and it is worth noting that flowering plants themselves, known as angiosperms, didn't evolve into the mid Jurassic. So that makes sense. True or false? Dinosaurs could not rotate their hands to face the ground, and this is called pronation. Now, what we mean by this is is if you hold your wrists out, sort of normal resting stance, you can rotate your wrist up and down. Your, your palm can face the ceiling, it can face the floor. Um, it's often popular in media, in toys. Jurassic Park is horribly guilty of this. For um, theropod dinosaurs, and it's specifically theropods, to have uh, bunny hands, essentially, 
where the they hold their hands sort of like little claw like bunny claws now that's pointing the palms towards the ground that's pronation the opposite of which being um, supination and uh, theropod dinosaurs couldn't do this they uh, in, the, in the resting stance of their arms the palms would be facing each other um and you can see this in in birds to be fair if, if they were bring their wings sort of down to that level of the resting like that with their wings outstretched they they, they they would be facing each other if you were to bend that down far enough um the only way the palms can face the ground is if the arms are lifted up at the shoulder and the shoulder joint rotates not the wrist joint um you do see pronation in um four-legged quadrupedal herbivore herbivorous dinosaurs um you see it in sauropods because they're a very long lineage they've had the time to evolve from um who couldn't who couldn't pronate their their hands through to sauropods on four legs who could i went through a period of um semi-pronation and that's what ceratopsians under the four-legged, uh, more recent four-legged herbivorous dinosaurs, i.e. Cretaceous, late Cretaceous, they would have that. They would have semi-pronated hands, essentially. Um, had they lived long enough to evolve, had they not been made extinct, it's highly probable that you would see the descendants of uh, Ceratopsians have pronated hands in much the same way that um, sauropods did so even when you look at a sauropod skeleton um those hands there are not pronate, uh, not facing the ground it's it's, it's so the palms are facing the ground um and they walk on like a fleshy a fleshy pad the palms aren't facing each other uh so here's a here's an interesting one um that is quite a recent thing and is always coming up which is really interesting and exciting really from my point of view i've been someone who's been interested in dinosaurs since I was very little. We will never know the true colour of dinosaurs, true or false. Now, until fairly recently, this would have been true. We would never have known that, we, or never would have really been able to confidently be able to say what coloured dinosaurs were. However, we found an example of, of a few dinosaurs, and I've got examples here. Anchionis, in 2010, Paleontologists studied this uh, well-preserved fossil of this small uh, raptorian from a deposit in China. And most of these fossils, I think, come from China because it has the fine silt that is necessary for the preservation of a interesting molecule called melamazones. Well, um... M melanin, but melamazones are the structures within cells that give things, biological things, their colour. So, freckles, hair colour, skin colour, whatever. Feather colour, in these cases, it's uh, melamazones that do that. And they found preserved melamazones in this silt. Now, the comparing these melamazones, these structures, with modern day birds, they found that there was a match between the shape and structure of these melamazones and modern birds, and so it is reasonable to infer that the colours would be the same. And so we have built up a network of dinosaurs, where especially feathered ones, where we know the colour. Example of this being Anchionis, uh, with its red head, red crest, red face, grey, greyish, dark greyish body, blackish wings with white on them in black tips. And similarly, we've got things like um, Sanusropteryx, who's another favourite dinosaur of mine, with its orange colouring, white belly, raccoon's mask, banded tail. Um, if you ever get a chance to see the fossil of this, it's remarkably well preserved. You can see the banding in the fossil itself. It's it's fantastic. Um, Archaeopteryx, Microraptor, you see examples of melamazones that match um, iridescence in uh, like blackbirds and magpies. So those like were likely iridescent as well. We even have non-feathered um, dinosaurs like Cetacosaurus, um, Boropelta, where the melamazones for the skin and the scales and, and the armour was preserved and you, we can make infernations about what colours these animals were as well. 
which is just fascinating, really, and, and, and just wonderful. Um, because when I was little, we never know the colour, and now we can make reasonable inferred guesses if we have the preserved melamazones. Now, obviously, there are factors where you can sort of reasonably make information without that. Um, animals that live in forest regions are, are more likely to be countershaded, things like that. So we can make good guesses about things like that. But this research really backed up being able to confidently do that. So next interesting question. Uh, were dinosaurs cold-blooded? Something that comes up quite often. Uh, did they get their body heat from external sources, i.e. the sun? Uh, it's a little bit of another trick question. Um, we don't really have a complete answer for it, to be fair. Um, one uh, Dinosaurs were once thought to be cold-blooded, ectothermic. And it's worth noting that dinosaurs are not necessarily thought of as warm-blooded which is called endothermy, it's likely that depending on the size of the animal, they would be somewhere in between, which is termed mesothermic, so middle-blooded. Um, it's The middle ground is really needed for things related to their size, so the size, their ability to, to adapt, the range at which dinosaurs inhabited. It's unlikely that they were strictly cold or warm-blooded, and it's more likely that they were mesothermic, so depending on the size, somewhere in the middle, able to do a bit of both, able to exploit more niches. Um, it, it's worth remembering that dinosaurs as a group have been around, or were around, are around, in case of birds, for an extremely, extremely long time. Much longer than we've been around, and so it's it's probable that it could have evolved, or, or did evolve, a system that was more derived than our own, allowing them to inhabit more niches. Um, just because an animal is ancient doesn't mean it's primitive, um, and we should ideally avoid using words like primitive or advanced when talking about evolution because what you're actually talking about is becoming more or less specialized for a particular niche or way of life and quite often if a particular niche for a particularly well derived animal and those are the words derived and basal derived is specialized basal is less specialized uh, not the herb not basil that's just a delicious herb for spaghetti bolognese and things basil less derived a less derived animal is, if a, a highly um, derived animal is adapted for a particularly small niche and something changes in that niche and they're no longer able to, to live in that niche, it is the basal, the less derived animals, quote unquote primitive, that are more likely to survive because they are more generalist, they're more likely to, to be able to, to survive than something that's incredibly specialised. So. It's worth bearing in mind that primitive and advanced are not suitable terms really to be using when talking about um, evolution. So, dinosaurs... Oh, we're into the tough stuff now, by the way. Um, I say tough, tougher. <laughs> so, bear with me. Um, feel free to fall asleep. That's fine too. Um, dinosaurs, whether or not this still is a, is a useful measurement is up for debate, but dinosaurs can roughly be divided into two groups based on hip type. Now, the two groups are, in English terms, uh, lizard-hipped and bird-hipped dinosaurs, which translates as Sariscian and Ornithischian. So, saw, lizard, ornithy, birds. Now, what's interesting, a sort of... Um, a throwback to when we didn't know the link between dinosaurs and birds is that the bird-hipped dinosaurs incorporates those dinosaurs that didn't evolve into birds. So we're talking about um, uh, your herbivorous dinosaurs, your, your, your thyreophorans, your marginocephalians, uh, ornithischians, uh, ornithopods, all of those dinosaurs. Um, it's your sauropods and your theropods who have quote-unquote lizard hips Sariski and pelvises that evolved into well, the theropods evolved into birds. The reason this is is because it's a it's a strange case of, of how the hips have actually evolved, where the Ornithischian pelvis looks like a modern day bird pelvis, but it's the Sariski and pelvis that evolved into that. Um, so fascinating little bit of how names can uh, confuse things a little bit. Dinosaurs could not chew. Now, 
Uh, I have a uh, three-year-old girl, and she has a little book about Diplodocus. Um, and in that book, it it talks about um, it's just a little children's book, so I'm, I don't hold it to a high degree of accuracy. But it does talk about it chewed with its rows of huge teeth, and it's a bit of a, a bit of a thing that we take for granted that animals can chew because as mammals, we have the capacity to move our jaw from side to side and chew, grinding the top teeth against the uh, grinding the low teeth. Sorry, against the top teeth. Now, dinosaurs couldn't do this, and depending on the family, they didn't even have the capacity to pseudo-chew. And I'll explain what that I mean by that in a minute. With, with regards to sauropods specifically, because that's what the book was about, um, they would most likely have, uh, or most commonly, sorry, had just had simple pegs as teeth, really. Um, they could be broad or narrow-shaped teeth. Um, and they would use these pegs to basically strip plants of their leaves of their foliage swallow it down as quickly as they could and let the body let the gut deal with that uh, but as such large animals that was an effective means of just eating as much as you can and letting the gut slowly digest it um there's on again off again debates about gastroliths um that is swallowed stones that, that would help the gut digest which is a possibility there but the, the point of this question is they they could not chew as a group um neither could many Herbivores, herbivorous dinosaurs, now many of them had, or we believe had cheeks to hold in plant material, but they would slice that plant material up as they pulled it up and then swallow it. There was no chewing action necessarily going on there. Um, same with uh, carnivores, um, you know, those pull off strips of meat, they, they would have many, um, I believe it, it, it's a tyrannosaurid trait, but many of them would have front little teeth that they could sort of nibble with to make sure they got every last bit of meat off the off the carcass but they wouldn't chew they would swallow that meat uh, and let the body digest it now the ones that could quote unquote chew or pseudo chew as i said earlier were um hadrosaurs and they had these these rows of teeth um like sort of great cliffs but the cliff surface is covered in, in lots and lots of little teeth. And they're called teeth batteries, and there's loads of them, continually growing and wearing and falling out. And what they would do is, although they couldn't move the jaw from side to side, these tooth sockets were set in such a way that they could rub the bottom set of teeth as they moved the jaw up and down against the top set of teeth, and they would very slightly move and grind plant material against each other. Um, these teeth would like I said, grind the plant material into a fine mush, pseudo-chew it, the, the, the cheeks often help keep the plant material in, and uh, and then they could swallow that. Uh, now, I, I alluded to earlier about lips. Um, now, many dinosaurs had cheeks. Theropods, we don't think, had cheeks. They wouldn't necessarily have a need to for not keeping plant materials in there. But it is highly likely, and I, be I believe the, the research is correct for this, that many of them, especially larger ones, would have had lips. The margins of the jaw show where blood vessels would exist that match up with lipped reptiles today. And it makes a certain amount of sense that you don't necessarily want your teeth exposed at all times where you are not living in an environment where they would be constantly kept wet. Now, for example, the reason I say that is that aquatic reptiles, such as, uh, well, in the case of crocodilians, don't have lips. Their teeth are generally exposed, but they live in an aquatic environment, so they keep their teeth wet. They won't dry out, they won't decay uh, and crack. Whereas many, most dinosaurs would not have lived necessarily near to water, and so are quite likely to have had teeth covered by lips to help protect them. Um, they still lost teeth at an appreciable rate, but you're not encouraging decay from lodged bits of meat and other things that would potentially affect the underlying flesh and bone and cause a nasty infection. So, uh, speaking of teeth, the teeth in dinosaurs are only found in which bones in the skull? And the reason I bring this up is that many models of dinosaurs show the teeth going all the way to the back of the mouth, sometimes in such a way that the dinosaur, the poor animal, could not even close its mouth. Now, 
the answer to this is that there are four, normally only three, bones in the skull that would have teeth. You've got your maxillary, which is your upper jawbone. You have your dentiary, which is your lower jawbone. Most dinosaurs had a premaxillary. In fact, probably all dinosaurs had a premaxillary or a premaxillary, which would also hold teeth at the very front of the jaw. In fact, the join between the premaxillary and the maxillary is where you get that notch in certain um, certain species. Some would have a predentiary, uh, but that's more likely in ones that would have evolved a beak or a front um, a horny sheath covered beak. So it's just interesting to bear in mind that these bones did not stretch the entire length of the mouth and the teeth in them normally stopped around about halfway through the skull. So you wouldn't get teeth going all the way back. Otherwise, the animal couldn't actually close its mouth. Um, it's also important when you think about the evolution of hearing in mammals in terms of our sort of back, the back angle of our, so the back bones of our jaw became our hearing bones uh, and our dentary bone became the primary bone sort of in the bottom, bottom of our mouth. So just interesting to bear in mind that when hearing evolved for us, had we had teeth all the way back in the other bones, we wouldn't have been able to evolve those into, into hearing. So it's, uh, yeah, interesting. But I won't get too far into mammalian hearing because that's not what I'm here to talk about. Uh, near the end now. So which bone, or oh, should, should I say, sorry, derived avian dinosaurs have which bone in their wrists that is missing from their less derived ancestors? Now, derived avian theropods, birds, had a bone in their wrist called a semi-lunate carpal. And what's interesting is if you follow the evolution of the, the wrist bones, so the carpals, from heterodontosaurids, um, herrerasaurids all the way through to modern day birds, you can see how the semi-lunate carpal, this little, this little semi half moon shaped bone, becomes basically the primary, if not sometimes the only real connecting carpal bone between the um, the wrist and, and the rest of the arm. And that bone is what allows them to fold their hands back and fold their wings in. Now, we can't do that. We don't have that bone. It can fold your arms back to, your hands back to about a 90 degree angle. Um, well, you fold it sideways, as a bird would. But they can fold it all the way back. It allows them to fold up their wings, tuck in their wings, keep them protected. Um, and there's one bone that's responsible for that. And it originally was two separate bones that, as you look through the evolutionary history, combined together, fused together to become this one uh, half moon shaped bone. It's quite prominent in Deinonychus um, uh, and, and, and more so in birds. So, fascinating bone. Uh, last question here, uh, and really the last question of this talk. Dinosaurs walked upright. Their weight is balanced on their toes. What is this form of locomotion called? And I ask this one again because sometimes in media you see it's it's common to see um, potentially common to sort of think of dinosaurs as walking on their their feet like we do, having a heel, but they don't. What they walk on is called digitigrade, and it's because they're walking on their toe bones. That whole bit that looks like a foot, that looks like they have a heel, that's just their toe bones. Very long toe bones. Their heel is probably about halfway up the leg. Um, it's that first joint in the leg that looks like it's their knees bending backwards, their backwards bending knee. That's the rank. That's their heel. That's the ankle. Um, that's that's where that's where that fits in. Their knee is much further up, um, whereas in us, it's obviously we've only got it's really got one joint in the actual leg. Their knee's further up. Um, the sort of more specialized version of this is called ungulograde, which is where it's, the, it's just the very tip. It's the nail of the toe. That you're walking on um, things like cows, horses, that sort of thing. Um, evolution of those is also fascinating, um, highly specialised as well, so worth looking into. But um, and for the record, what we walk on, where we walk on the, on our ankle essentially, our heel, is called plantar grade, um, which carries its own benefits and and downsides. So um, thank you very much for listening. If you're still with me, uh, if you are still with me, I would love to hear from you. Please drop comments. Please 
like and subscribe, hit the bell, all that good stuff. As I said at the beginning, I do have a Patreon. Um, all my content will be free. I will always release it free on YouTube, on this channel. But if you are interested in supporting me, maybe getting some extra goodies, you can vote in polls, uh, that sort of thing, please do consider giving my Patreon a look. It is highly appreciated. And until next time, I wish you uh, a happy good, happy day, good evening, good morning, whatever time of day it is for you. And yeah, have a good one.